This is our view, the voice of Washington's working families, brought to you by the proud members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. The Labor family has gathered in Olympia to send a message to the legislature and the governor, put the people first. It was the biggest demonstration in the Capitol has seen since about 1992, complete with a surprise guest from Wisconsin, which has become symbolic in the national economic and political war against workers. I want to thank you. You've come from all around the state. You've taken time away from work. You've taken time from school. You've taken time from your families to exercise your basic fundamental democratic rights. This, brothers and sisters, is what democracy looks like. Sisters and brothers, the billionaires and bankers brought our economy to its knees and they brought about the resulting budget deficits. They treated our economy as if it were a giant casino, and they bet our industrial base, they bet our education funding, they bet our health care benefits, they bet our jobs, wages, and benefits against the House. They won and we lost. They stuck us with rising unemployment, rising poverty, rising foreclosures, and the worst distribution of income and wealth since the 1920s. Well, now, they have the gall throughout this country and the federal government. Now we're being told that we're at fault, that public servants, that's right, vote them out, there you go. They've, uh, they're telling us that state employees and public servants, well, their wages, their health care, and their pensions are just too high, too costly. They're telling us that the children, the poor, and the vulnerable use too much health care, too costly. They're telling us that education is just too expensive and we're going to have to raise tuition by double digits over the next two years. What do we say to that? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we do not have a budget deficit. We have a social service deficit. We have a jobs deficit. We have a revenue deficit. And we have a deficit of leadership. Budget should be at least as good as the people of Washington State, don't you think? Yeah. We need a budget that funds our safety net. We need a budget that puts our children, our communities, our public safety first. We must put need before corporate greed. There are billions in state tax loopholes. Billions. Let's close them up! So now, sisters and brothers, it's my honor to introduce to you a special guest. For a few moments, he is here to seek sanctuary among the safety of thousands of friends, all of you who have come here today. Brothers and sisters, let's say, on Wisconsin! Fight for freedom! Brothers and sisters, please welcome Senator Spencer Coggs of the 6th District in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. One of the courageous Wisconsin people. We thought we were holding up these terrible, terrible bills, but what we were doing is we were holding the nation together. We were doing things that people began to catch on on. First, it was kind of sort of the media. The media caught on, and we were on Good Morning America, and you know, um, uh, The Ed Show, Rachel Maddow, and all those different kinds of shows. And even Fox News came along too. But then, I love that. <laughs> and even Governor Walker got in the media. He was on TV as well, only he got punked. Uh, 
he thought he was talking to one of his rich backers and they were talking about, you know, putting bats to our heads. Uh, they were talking about doing things to us that weren't so pleasant. And they were talking about the rallies that got in Wisconsin. First, hundreds of people came, then thousands of people came, and then a hundred thousand came. Our Federation's president spoke at the recent memorial for the Department of Transportation on workers killed while doing their jobs. We would like to see a memorial someday when no more names are added to the list. We simply can't lose any more DOT workers. They are vital to our state. But more importantly, they are husbands and wives dads and moms, sons and daughters. The impact on the families left behind is the most tragic outcome. In the words of Mother Jones, we mourn the dead, but we will fight like hell for the living. And on safety, both union and management agree, and we are ready to partner for safety every single day. Thank you. kept working with our Preston crew, even though he could have long retired. This was about at least his third career. Billy continued to work because he took pride in making our highway safe for drivers. While the governor, the state house and senate, as well as Area 5 maintenance co-workers have honored Billy, the entire Washington State Department of Transportation family will also forever remember Billy. I now want to take this opportunity to personally thank Betty for sharing Billy with us. His pride and joy was snow plowing I-818. And, um, Who's ever going to be doing that for the next years? Believe me, Billy will be with you in spirit and he will guide you on how to maneuver and take care of that highway of his. So if you're, you're out there plowing and you get a little nudge or feel like somebody's with you, that's my husband, that's the type of person he was. The international president of the Iron Workers Union visited Seattle and during one gathering had a special message for the apprentices. The message was one that all of labor needs to hear. And you're a member of organized labor. You're a member of the greatest social movement this country has ever seen. You're a member of the people who created the middle class in this country. And what you see now is a tremendous struggle going on to retain that, to retain a middle class in this country. Because the people that are opposed to us, the people that we fight, they haven't changed, those spots haven't changed for the last thousands of years. They have their beliefs that, that workers are just a commodity that they can cast aside. And you see a tremendous amount of wealth in this country moving towards the, the upper echelons. I mean, when you have the 400 richest people in this country, 400 individuals, they have as much assets as 155 million people in this country. 50% of the assets of this country are controlled with 400 individuals. Now some of those individuals are good people. Some of them understand what their responsibilities are, but unfortunately for the most they don't. You see this huge separation coming out. And you see the, uh, the, the wealthy, you see the, the things that are being passed in the, in Congress and in state legislatures designed to give them more, more and more and more. And they have to come from somewhere. And where's it come from? It comes from the working people of this country. When you see that the, the top 25 hedge fund managers average $650 million a year, and, and they were able to get it so they're only taxed at 15%. That's less than most of the taxes you pay sitting here in this room. There's not, this isn't about 
to them, it's not a matter of about equality or fairness or anything. It's about of how much more can we garner in. And the only people standing in our way at this date and time is organized labor. She was known as Mother Jones, and she was born this month in labor history. May Day, International Labor Day. Can you imagine actually having that as your birthday? The woman we're celebrating today was born on May Day, May 1, a little over 50 years before May Day was associated with the working classes of our planet. Mary Harris was born May 1, 1830, in a cottage near Cork, Ireland. Her parents were simple Irish peasants, and it was a proud and defiant heritage. In the late 1830s, the Harris family moved to Toronto, Ontario. After her education in Toronto, Mary graduated from normal school at age 17 with a newfound talent for debating. By 1859, she was a secular teacher at a convent in Michigan, earning $8 a month. She moved to Memphis and continued to teach. There, in 1861, she met and married George E. Jones, an iron molder. She learned from Jones especially about unionism and the psychology of the working man. In the autumn of 1867, a plague of yellow fever in Memphis took Mary's husband, son, and three daughters. At age 37, Mary Joan Harris Jones was a childless widow. In lieu of a family, Mary Harris Jones adopted America's toilers, and they called her mother. From the mines of West Virginia and Pennsylvania to Homestead and to Ludlow, after which she was held incognito in the jail in Walsenburg, Colorado for a month. You can visit that jail right now today. I've been there. Mother Jones was born seven years before Queen Victoria ascended to the throne and less than 50 years after the end of the American Revolution. She died in 1930 on the eve of the New Deal. She could quote speeches she heard Lincoln make. She helped and, wa and watched unions grow from secret groups of hunted men to what she feared was a complacent part of the established order. She spanned an incredible time to live in America. It was a time in which one needed to fight very hard to survive. That she did. Mother Jones was a labor agitator. When a college professor once praised her as a great humanitarian, she corrected him, saying, get it right. I'm not a humanitarian, I'm a hell raiser. Her skill was the invaluable but incalculable one of tending to men's spirits, of buoying them, of goading them to fight even though the battle seemed hopeless. As a vagabond agitator, she left little behind. She did leave behind the memory of a larger than life personage. This has been Our View, brought to you by the members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. We remind you, when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Thank you for watching and please join us again.